Hello and welcome to another episode of the Vegan Next Door podcast. I'm your host, Marissa Price, and each week I'll be bringing you a new episode discussing different topics related to how and why to go vegan, as well as how to live a more compassionate, ethical lifestyle and to inspire those around you to do so. This podcast is for anyone who's ever thought about going vegan, vegetarian, or for anyone who is already vegan and vegetarian, a sense of community, so that way you can continue to make these ethical choices and to encourage those around you to do the same and continue to better your own corner of the world. You can follow me on Instagram at the Vegan Next Door Cast. Please watch my stories as well as my posts. You can also like my page on Facebook, The Vegan Next Door, and you can join the Facebook group, The Vegan Next Door Group, on Facebook to discuss weekly shows and anything of your fancy. Please join and add to the discussion. Welcome to episode nine. Hope that you had a wonderful week. This This week's episode, I'm continuing with my theme of interviews because sitting down with the friendly vegan next door is what it is all about. So this week, we have a good friend of mine, Emmy, and she'll be talking about how she went vegan and even further on how we used to work at PETA together and now she's working for herself. So she's talking about sort of the intersection of her uh, ethical veganism and just her mindful um, values in general and how that plays a role into her starting her own business and, um, you know, being a part of different jobs and maybe not always agreeing with what they do, uh, which is partially what led her to PETA and then to, like I said, now running her own business and working for herself. So I th- lots of great advice there about um, – the workplace and holding uh, to your values in the workplace and also entrepreneurialism. So super excited to dive into that. And before we get to that, just want to go over our, our normal show sections here. So little catch up with me. Um, not a whole lot's been going on, just been working this week. And uh, last weekend I had yoga teacher training, which was really cool. Um, it's it's uh, getting better and better every time that we have a class. And um, if you are interested at all in yoga teacher training, just send me a message and let me know because I would love to share some details with you if it's something like you've thought about doing or if you just even want to deepen your own practice. You don't really have to want to be a yoga teacher to do it. So, um, it's really cool stuff. You know, physical yoga is really only one eighth of what yoga is. So we do a lot of physical yoga, but more often than not, we're talking about human anatomy. We're talking about breathing techniques. We're talking about philosophy, um, ethics, ancient yoga, reading, um, you know, text, learning how to say certain words in Sanskrit and, uh, and debating about philosophy and how we can apply like ancient yogic principles to modern life today. So it's really, really cool stuff. That's about it with me. Um, although last night we went to a vegan pop-up at a brewery that was really awesome. They had a bunch of vegan food trucks and I posted pictures of the amazing food on Instagram in case you're curious. We had this huge like boat of french fries that were pad thai style fries so it was like you were having pad thai but instead of noodles it was french fries so it was like um hoisin sauce and bean sprouts and scallops and um some other kind of probably like sriracha vegan mayo kind of thing and actual sriracha and oh they were just incredible and then we had um a beyond burger so good. And then we had wood-fired pizza, and they made their own vegan cheese, and uh, some beer, of course. So it was really great, and then we we finished it off with some vegan cupcakes. It's a really cool event. They do that like once a month, so I'd encourage you to to uh, look around in your, your nearby city um, and see if they've got like vegan food trucks. Um, oh, they also had vegan fried chicken that was there, and like vegan peach cobbler, but we didn't have any of that. 
um, just because we were so overwhelmed with all of the other delicious options. So that was cool. It was a really fun, fun way to break up the week. Um, but yeah, that's about it for me. So podcast updates. Uh, the Patreon page is looking for some patrons. So if you are enjoying this free podcast, please consider becoming a patron. So this is something that you can pledge to give $2 a month. You can give more if you would like. And this helps me with um, keeping up the ongoing costs of running the podcast. There are a few. Um, But also to reach some really exciting goals that I have in mind um, to get some uh, professional, you know, semi-professional, just some decent uh, recording equipment um, to improve the podcast, but also to start doing videos. I really want to start doing some recipe videos. I'm thinking I could do like a recipe a week and then show me making it. Um, And so I'll probably pick some of my favorite recipes, my tried and true methods. But also if there was a recipe that you all wanted me to try out, like if you were curious about how it was going to go, I would love to try it out for you and show you every step of the way, the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, and see how the recipe goes. So um, that's one of the goals. And some other future goals are some meetups and workshops that we could actually get some of the listeners together and we could do like a little vegan uh, getaway. So super cool stuff. Um, If you have any ideas of other things that you'd like to see in the podcast, please let me know. And I would be happy to uh, do those, uh, maybe change some of the Patreon goals, depending on on what everybody wants. You know, it's ultimately about creating a community and me being here as a resource and a guide for you on our shared journey of extending compassion to our own corners of the world. So always open to feedback. Um, Let me know if you have any questions or thoughts about Patreon. Um, or other show topics or goals. And also, if um, you can't become a patron, that's totally fine. Um, But it'd be cool if you could write a review on iTunes or um, just do anything that you can to spread the word out about the podcast. You can tag me on Facebook or Instagram um, just to really get the word out there. That would be really helpful. Just always trying to expand the community and um, make this information more available to anyone who might be looking for it. So anything you can do there and also join the Facebook group. We've got lots of people who've uh, liked the page recently. A few people have joined the group, Um, but joining the group is the best way to stay a part of the community. You can introduce yourself there. And, um, you know, we've got a few folks who will be on there um, or who are on there and, you know, will comment and such. And so I hope that that just continues to grow. We can share recipes, ask questions, just keep it a positive environment. You know, there's no, um, there's no bad questions. There's no, um, stupid questions. So it, you know, is monitored to make sure that it's, it's a positive environment. I'm really not worried about anyone, but just want you to know as a listener that it is a safe space that you could ask or ask anything, um, about, about veganism and animal rights on there. Great. So some, uh, new segment moving on, uh, a couple of headlines that I thought were really interesting. So, Veg News, you know, my favorite place to get vegan news, um, is really cool. There's a survey that found that two-thirds of Americans would eat clean meat. So, we've talked about clean meat before. This is meat that's, like, you know, basically made in a lab. Uh, So, it is actual meat. Like, it contains cholesterol or any of the, well, a lot of the other bad things that meat has in it for you. But it's slaughter-free. So no animals had to die for it. And it does not contain the added hormones or antibiotics that are often found in meats. Um, So that's a pro as well. So anyway, um, two-thirds of Americans said that they uh, would would be all about it. Uh, 46% said they'd regularly buy it. 40% said that they would be willing to pay more. And 53% of people said that they're interested in replacing conventional animal agriculture all together to just do away with what we've got going on now. Because I think most people realize that it's not working for a variety of reasons. And most people don't like to see or hear about animals being hurt and being slaughtered. Um, and 64% they believe, said that they uh, agree that clean meat is a positive innovation. 73% said it was more environmentally friendly, and a majority believed that it would be a safe, healthy, and taste 
same taste as conventional meat. So we've got several uh, leading companies around the world that are leading the charge here on clean meat. In Europe, it's called Mosa. In the U.S., we've got Just, the same folks that make the mayo that we've talked about, and another company called Memphis Meats. And Israel's got Super Meat and Future Meat Technologies. So they're all working on this, um, and they're hoping to debut it on the market ASAP, and apparently, according to this article, the first clean meat products may come as early as sometime this year, so 2018, uh, which is crazy because I think we're more than halfway done with the year. So, wow, how how cool. You know, I personally am not super into it, but I haven't had meat in years, so I love all these vegan meats, and I like that they kind of taste like meat, um, but I would not be into actual meat because of all the health reasons that we've talked about on this podcast, but you know, I'll support anything if it's not slaughtering animals. So if this slaughter free clean meat is going to be replacing the meat that, you know, Americans who are eating meat are eating, then I'm all for it. Another, um, cool headline is that, uh, over to our friends across the pond, we have a UK, uh, football team, Remember, that is soccer for us Americans. Um, That is all vegan. They're called um, Forest Green Rovers. And I've heard about them before. Um, They went vegan a few years ago. But they um, are now launching their own line of foods that are going to be found in universities and schools across the UK. I just think it is so cool that they have an all-vegan soccer team, football team, um, in the UK, and uh, they've been vegan for a few years now, and um, they said that we've done it for three reasons. It's better for the animals, it's better for the environment, and it's better for people's health and nutrition. And um, so now that, you know, they want to try to get, uh, you know, spread this good message and get it all over the UK. So they've got a bunch of different um, things. They've got Moroccan style balls, a chili cheeseburger, and these are going to be um, through all kinds of school caters and universities all over the UK. Um, but also, this football team, their home football stadium is all vegan. They have literally banned and removed all animal products from the team's stadium menu. They also have uh, solar panels and a chemical free lawn and the United Nations has noticed all of their eco-friendly initiatives and they've granted the team with a carbon neutral certification and they are the only football team to have uh, that certification from the United Nations. Wow, how cool. If I lived in the UK, I would definitely be at that stadium watching those uh, football games all the time and chowing down on some vegan burgers. That sounds amazing. If we have any listeners over in the UK... Uh, let me know if you've been there, and you should go and check it out if you haven't been. So that's really cool. Their um, food line, in case you're curious, is called the Little Green Devils, um, but they really just want to push uh, meat and dairy-free uh, days, like an entire day where the school goes meat and dairy-free, um, and then these these lunches are, are going to help the schools accomplish that goal. So really cool. Hopefully that uh, continues to grow and expand. Need to see. Great, so now we're going to head over to our main event, our interview. Hello. Well, today we have my good friend, Emmy, and I wanted to bring her on because she is a big role model of mine. I look up to her in so many different ways and have fun with her every time that we've ever been together, Uh, going around to the farmer's markets in LA and getting turmeric lattes and things like that. So I wanted to bring her on here to discuss um, her thriving business and how she now works for herself um, as a vegan and an ethical vegan and to see how this really plays a role in, um, you know, your business life and uh, the evolutions that's taken throughout the different um, positions you've held and, and businesses you've started. So, so Emmy, welcome. Do you mind giving us a, a little introduction of yourself? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, as you said, my name is Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am currently living in Portland, Maine. 
uh, although I moved back to Portland from Los Angeles, California, and that's where I met you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, I've lived in a bunch of different places, but currently settled in Portland, uh, which is, if you haven't been, a very, very small city in mm. beautiful, scenic Maine. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And um, yeah, so what I do for work, I work as a content marketing strategist, which is basically just applying um, content marketing or marketing using uh, things like writing, visual imagery, and also applying SEO to people's marketing campaigns to, of course, help create more engagement for their brand or organization. Awesome. That's really cool. That sounds wonderful. Um, yeah. So, so Emmy and I met, um, when we both worked at PETA in LA, but, uh, Emmy, you've been doing this type of work even long before you came to PETA. And I thought it'd be really interesting to talk to you about the evolution of your career and how, um, just, you know, being an ethical vegan and maybe even before you were vegan, I'm not sure, just being a more of a, a mindful, um, you know, person that tries to match like your job with your ethics. So wanted to kind of hear about that evolution. So maybe like some of the positions, how'd you get started uh, in what you do? And then how has that progressed over time? Yeah, um, I kind of fell into marketing. Uh, I was working in the hospitality industry, uh, managing a front desk at a hotel, and really just uh, kind of passing the time and paying the bills. It was something that I, uh, I was excited about it because it was my first job in Portland in a new place. And it was honestly very, very fun. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't fulfilling me in any way that felt meaningful. Mm -hmm. And I had just recently graduated from college. So I genuinely didn't know what was going to feel meaningful to me. <laughs> yeah, you had to try out some different things. Yeah. So as I was working in hospitality and being fairly bored, I did start blogging and I also started drawing some kind of, uh, I'm not going to call them comics because they're in no way near the kind <laughs> of comics that I admire, but some um, sketches and just scribbles with captions that I thought were funny. <laughs> uh, for anybody out there who's worked in hospitality, you know that it can be kind of frustrating when you deal with a uh, with the more snarky folks out there. Um, so it was kind of a way for me to just uh, express my creativity. And uh, I didn't really think it through, but I put it online. And that's how I got my first gig at a marketing agency. Somebody saw that work that Whoa. I had done and just said, you should come, um, you know, kind of learn the ropes and, and start out you know, creating content here at this small startup agency that they had going on. So of course, uh, I jumped ship immediately and uh, went the, I think, three blocks away to where <laughs> the office would be. And again, Portland is very small. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's yeah, so amazing. started there and uh, yeah, it was, it was quite the change. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as that progressed, you know, I learned about all these different things in marketing, web marketing, web marketing, specifically SEO and how to write for marketing, um, how to create online content that's going to get people to engage. I learned so much in my first mm -hmm. year and a half in that mm -hmm. agency and, um, very quickly moved to a larger agency, um, and that's kind of where my little transition into um, marketing marketing in and also applying it to my life because as much as i loved doing what i was doing at the agency there mm -hmm. they were able to pick my clients for me mm -hmm. and i think you will totally understand what i'm saying here when you decide you're going to go vegan um you change things a little bit slowly you know maybe the mm -hmm. first thing you do is become a vegan in the dietary sense mm -hmm. and 
And I think for a lot of us, that's where we go vegan first. We start changing what's in our refrigerator, what's in our cabinets, and what we ultimately eat. Mm -hmm. That was the first thing that happened for me. But as my vegan transition continued to grow and I was, you know, shifting my closet and changing other aspects of my life that I didn't immediately consider, Mm -hmm. I realized that some of the clients that I was serving in my awesome marketing job, unfortunately, weren't things that I felt I could market. (laughs) They were things that I didn't feel good about. And uh, so that was kind of almost just another step in my vegan transition was making sure my, what I was doing for work aligned with my ethical stance as well. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So, so timeline here, like when, when did you go vegan? Was it like in college or was it uh, during this marketing job or? or, Yeah, I guess it was right about the same time that I started out in marketing. Uh, Mm. It was a very transitional time in my life. Yeah. And and that New Year's, um, I, I just decided to go vegan. And I think I said I was going to go vegan for a month. That was a New Year's resolution for me. Mm. And as I, obviously educated myself there was no way I could go back <laughs> <obviously. Yeah. laughs> um, mm. so yeah it stuck and so did marketing <laughs> yeah so also like side note you know um what what did make you go vegan um I'm trying to really really remember kind of the first thing I feel like it was a lot of things at once that had started stewing in my brain. You know, when you know something is going to feel more right, or you know (laughs) something (laughs) you're doing, you're in that place of cognitive dissonance, uh, where you're doing something, but it doesn't, doesn't agree with where you, where you'd like to be. Yeah. Um, I was, I was still, I was a vegetarian at that time, but even when I ate cheese, I, I knew a lot of, a lot of what was happening in the dairy industry. And I kind of just turned away from it. I kind of Mm -hmm. just did what a lot of people do, I think, and Mm -hmm. said like, whatever piece of cheese I don't eat today isn't going to save a cow's life. I genuinely thought that I couldn't make any kind of impact with my small actions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think most yeah, people feel that way. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, I think most people feel that way for sure. I think, I think a lot of people get it, but you know, they feel like their action isn't going to make a big difference, which, which is sad, you know, like that's definitely a, a disempowered feeling it's a hard feeling for sure. And I think, you know, we face that in a lot of different facets of our life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in the scheme of things, like we are all very, very small. (laughs) Yeah. In the scheme of things, we're all super small, but if enough people start making changes, of course, something bigger is going to change. Every little ripple, it's like that butterfly effect thing. Every little ripple does have an effect. Every, you know, tiny, tiny thing that you can do uh, can make a big impact in some way. So yeah, I think that once that resonated with me, once I realized, you know what, I might as well just make the change. I might as well just, you know, make this a New Year's resolution and see if it sticks you know, there was, there was no turning back at that point. (laughs) You can't unlearn, you can't unsee. And I definitely, uh, learned a lot from PETA articles. I had, Mm -hmm. I had seen them pop up in my feed and I felt, I think the way that a lot of people do, uh, seeing PETA articles, they were jarring to me. Mm -hmm. and I felt like, oh my gosh, like stop reminding me. (laughs) My heart, (laughs) I already knew. So I think that a lot of people feel when they see a PETA article that they know is true Mm -hmm. or that they, you know, see evidence of, Mm -hmm. um, they feel like, oh, come on. Like, 
I already know this. It's almost like somebody saying, you know, oh, did you did you do your homework? Or did you do your chores? Or did you pay your bills? <laughs> yeah, you know you've got to do it. You know in your heart that it's the right thing to do, but it sometimes sucks to have somebody remind you. Yeah. Oh my God. That's so true. I, I feel that way all the time. Um, uh, you know, especially like with, with veganism stuff, like I think that that's why a lot of people's first reactions when they meet a vegan or hear something about veganism is that, you know, people get defensive. Um, because I think so many people know, you know, and, and like I say on the podcast all the time that, I believe that, you know, most people are good and and that most people love animals and they don't like to see or hear about animals being hurt. So then when, when there's a vegan who's like, (laughs) yeah, like comes into the party or whatever. And they're like, oh, I don't eat animals because I don't want to hurt animals. Everyone's like, yeah, yeah. Like we don't want to hurt animals either, but we're still doing it. It's part of life. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like (laughs) I've actually heard that argument. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. I've heard that too. Or like, like my grandma, she, um, she tries a lot of vegan stuff, um, and eats a lot of vegan stuff whenever we're together, which is awesome. Um, that's definitely more than I know a lot of other people's, um, family members will do. So that's amazing. Um, but you know, she, when I, when I tell her stuff like this, she's like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Like, I just want to enjoy what I always enjoy. Like I want to enjoy a steak every now and then. But, you know, but then she also like says that she wants to like rescue pigs, you know? So it's like, yeah. I think, um, so that, so that is like encouraging. Like when we, we see every day these like nationwide food chains incorporating more vegan options and restaurant chains incorporating vegan stuff, just anything to make veganism more accessible and easier, I think is awesome because like I said, I believe people are good. So I believe that that's already there. Like some people just don't know, but other people know and just feel like they can't make that change. So anyway, it's easier. I'm like, hell yeah, because we're just going to get more vegans and we're going to save more animals that way. It is. I think that once people see that they have a choice, um, then, then they're going to make right choices, even if they don't consciously think they will, because you know, we don't think with our taste buds, we think with our brains and we think with our hearts to a point. Um, If we allow that and we stop allowing, you know, or even thinking that non-vegan food somehow tastes better than vegan food, obviously we both know that that's not true. (laughs) (laughs) As soon as people can get it through their minds that uh, vegan food is delicious and accessible and easy to make, (laughs) Mm -hmm. then, you know, it's going to be kind of a why not situation. Yeah. Yeah. So true. So cool. So you mentioned, um, seeing a lot of like PETA articles and videos and stuff helped you to go vegan. And then who knew that years later you would work for PETA? Like, did you know? Cause I didn't like people, when I was vegetarian for a really long time and people would be like, oh, are you a vegan? And I'd be like, oh, no way. That's like, I love cheese. And then I, they'd be like, you're not one of those PETA people, are you? And I'd be like, oh no, those people are crazy. (laughs) And then like years later, look at me now. So (laughs) did you have a similar experience? I did for sure. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah. I have very clear memories of, um, getting really junky. Uh, I think they were fried chicken fingers um at my college uh we called it the crack shack and that's you know that's not a great name (laughs) it was um kind of the little annex to the dining hall that was open later you could get really junky food there kind of at any time of the day yeah so being a college student and being you know not not super healthy I was all about going there and I I do remember seeing uh a pita it made it might have been a pita poster or it was something that had been posted near my dining hall carrying out my chicken fingers and feeling rage in oh. <laughs> my belly thinking like how how dare you challenge <laughs> what I'm about to put into my mouth? And I think a lot of 
people feel that way. Totally. Wow. That's so interesting. Yeah. So I had no, obviously, I had no clue back then that I would be working for PETA in college. Honestly, I had no clue what I wanted to do with my life. Not Mm -hmm. even, I changed my mind about it maybe twice a day. I just (laughs) didn't know. And I I commend people who do know because they're going to get there faster. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) For those of us who went to a liberal arts school and Mm -hmm. got a pretty vague degree like me, um, Mm -hmm. I had no clue that I would end up in marketing and then end up in a marketing position at PETA of all Mm -hmm. places. No, Mm -hmm. I would never have guessed that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think most people don't know or people think they know what they want to do. And then they realize it's maybe not the direction that they want to go later on, you know, because life is long. And and I read an article a couple of years ago that really resonated with me that was like, you know, millennials um, and uh, the one before that, Gen Z, right? Or is it Gen Zers? Yeah. Gen Zers is the one before millennials, right? Oh, Gen, I think Gen Xers are before millennials and then Gen Zers are Oh, okay. Or after millennials. Yeah. Yes, that's right. Well, just really just kind of saying that like, you know, it was different for maybe like our grandparents and like baby boomers, but now people are living longer and they're working longer, like yeah. in their lifetime. And so like on average, it said on, on average, a millennial would have, um, and again, this was a few years ago, so I'm not sure how it applies to our, our Gen Zers, but a millennial would have like 14 different jobs in seven different career paths yes. in their lifetime. <laughs> yep. And I remember reading that in college and it was like kind of scary, but also like a relief that made me feel better. Like knowing that like, okay, it's good to try things out. And I also had like a mentor in high school, like mm. one of my teachers and she was my cross country coach also. And, um, she was like, a, she was my like, AP English teacher. So, you know, talking about college in the future was like always part of our conversations. And she told me that like, she would be worried if I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Oh, that's nice to hear. (laughs) Yeah. She was like, it's, it's, it's about the journey and you have to like figure things out. Kind of like you said with your jobs, um, how you weren't sure, you know, what you wanted to do and you, you didn't know what was going going to feel fulfilling until you tried it. So I think that that's really reassuring to folks. And, and also it can change over time. Like, you know, something can be totally satisfying and fulfilling for 10, 15, 20 years, and then you can change your mind and do something else. It's true. Yeah. And I think that Gen Xers as well as um, millennials, our generation, and um, probably the Gen Zers as well, Mm -hmm. don't feel um, or hopefully aren't feeling the crazy amount of pressure that maybe the baby boomers felt when they were in school to decide probably even before they graduated high school what they were going to do for what probably was going to be the rest of their lives I think a lot of them felt like they had to make that decision uh, especially Mm -hmm. women Mm -hmm. Are, am I going to go into a career or am I going to be a housewife? I really think that may have been a question that unfortunately was yeah. in women's minds. And that to me is like, my goodness, like, I'm so glad we have so many more options and also the <laughs> option to potentially do your own thing and make your own career. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and just allowing that it's nice that, that society is turning to like allow people to have that space to really, you know, uh, try to align your, your job, hopefully, you know, at least a little bit with your passions or your values at the very least, because you could apply, you know, I'm like, you know, my position at PETA, I like work with college students and we encourage them all the time. Like you don't have to come work in the animal rights movement for one of the major nonprofit animal rights organizations to help animals. Like we need vegan doctors. We need vegan politicians. We need vegan marketing specialists. You know, (laughs) we need vegans like everywhere because, you know, you don't need to necessarily other yourself by, 
by working only with other vegans. Like it's great to be in contact with all types of people because there's more to you than being vegan, obviously. You're yeah. multidimensional. Yeah. And that's honestly something that because I didn't become vegan until um let's see, how old was I? Until I was twenty four. Um mm-hmm. just for perspective, I'm thirty now. <laughs> um 30 flirty and thriving uh, yes (laughs) because I didn't um become vegan until a little later and Mm -hmm. while I was just embarking into my career Mm -hmm. I did kind of feel like it's it's all or nothing for me in that I felt like this needs to be my career now Mm -hmm. Um, and it wasn't until it became my career that I realized that I could still make an impact having it be part of my life and Mm -hmm. one of, you know, my deeply held values without it being my nine to five. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) I love that. I think that's so helpful for folks to hear, you know? Um, And, and I feel that as well. Like it still is my nine to five, but sort of knowing like if for some reason it couldn't be my nine to five um you know like just like with this podcast kind of like we hear from people all over the place and how they're doing like little like everyday activism sort of in small ways like wearing a vegan t-shirt and helping their friends and family go vegan and you know um, finding vegan meetup clubs and, and doing some sort of like outreach maybe even with uh leaflets at the gym or something like there's just so many different ways that you can, can make an impact. And and it's almost helpful to like, you know, so many, um, major animal rights organizations, uh, you know, obviously a lot of folks work remote like I do, but also a lot of them are very kind of insular and you have to work in a certain office, which means that everyone like a V like vegans from all over the world and all over the country come to that one little city or town or whatever to work in that one office which means yeah. that pretty much everyone they're interacting with every single day is vegan. And yeah. they're really not like, like they're doing great work during their nine to five, but like, they're not really like rubbing off on any non-vegans like <laughs> in their life. Cause like I noticed such a huge shift when I left LA and left my PETA bubble and you can probably say the same thing. And then, so now I'm working remotely, but like outside of work, I'm surrounded by mostly non-vegans. Like luckily my boyfriend and my family are vegan, but anytime I go anywhere around here, like most people are not vegan. So I'm able to like really rub off on my environment. Yeah, I I definitely feel the same way. Uh, Leaving LA and the PETA vegan bubble and coming back to a place that I already knew uh, is just not not a hugely vegan area Mm -hmm. um although I found now there are there is a community of vegans I don't you know in Maine I don't Mm -hmm. run into them on a day-to-day basis but they're here yeah Um, (laughs) thanks Facebook for you know allowing us to put together groups yeah Um, totally but I would say that I'm, I'm not quite social enough to feel like I'm rubbing off on anybody in my close geographic range but Mm -hmm. I do enough uh, communicating with people who are clients uh, Mm -hmm. who are you know not geographically close to me but Mm -hmm. outside of my bubble um, Mm -hmm. and hoping that I do rub off in some small way. Yeah so that's amazing so let's talk a little bit more about that so we talked about how you got your um, how you found your way into marketing which is really cool story and then So then that eventually led you to PETA, right? And then you were at PETA for a bit. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. So I kind of decided in my head, I'm going to move to LA and work for PETA. Mm -hmm. Um, That was a conscious thought that I had. Um, At the time, there actually wasn't a position available um, that that really worked for me. Uh, Mm -hmm. I had looked and I ended up uh, making a video (laughs) and I watched it the other day and my goodness, (laughs) I am a nerd. Uh, 
<laughs> just looking at it, I was just very like loosey goosey. I was sitting out on my porch at the time and I was like, hi, I'm Emmy. I live in Maine and um, <laughs> I want to come to LA and I want to work for PETA. And I'm so passionate about this cause. And I mean, none of that has changed, but um, thankfully people saw that and thought uh, that I was enthusiastic enough that I, uh, I should come interview. And Oh, I think- so you sent that to two people at PETA? Yeah, I did. Um, Whoa. Yeah, and I didn't know anybody, but um, I had a friend of a friend of a friend who worked at PETA, and um, after very briefly saying hello on Facebook and connecting, I said, could you send this video to somebody in charge of potentially hiring? <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was super awkward, and it was very like uh, – I, I had no belief in my heart that it would actually happen, but it was definitely uh, purposeful. I definitely wanted to move to LA. I wanted to work for PETA. And uh, within, I don't know, maybe six months of having that thought and making that video, I moved to LA and worked for PETA. Wow. That's amazing. It was, I mean, it was a cool and big change and such a cool experience. I worked um, at PETA for a little over a year, um, which doesn't sound like a hugely long time. And it did fly by because time flies when you're having fun. But my job uh, was definitely the most challenging job I've ever had in my life. I worked as the online projects manager, uh, handling, putting together the investigations pages for PETA as well mm. as managing the homepage. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of very tight timelines. There were a lot of, um, there was a lot of constant communication. I was managing a lot of work. Uh, and it was, it was just a fast paced job. Yeah. And I yeah. learned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny. Like PETA is a nonprofit, but I feel like a lot of, um, a lot of the way like that, you know, everything is taken seriously and it's fast paced. I don't think it has too much of, um, you know, like what a lot of people associate with nonprofits. Like, you know, I've just known a lot of folks who, who work for like small environmental organizations or like small (laughs) organizing organizations. I'm like, no, PETA likes to play, you know, in the big leagues. Like it, PETA compares itself to major corporations that like run the country, you know? And that's yeah. valid. That's absolutely valid. Everybody there takes yeah. the job so seriously because yeah. we all feel so. See, I'm still saying we. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, once you're a PETA or, you know, always a PETA person or something. It's in your heart, yes. Yeah. Um, but everybody cares so much about what they're doing. Yeah. So those deadlines just feel, uh, you know, valid. Yeah. You know that what you need to do has to happen right away. You know that there's no time to waste. So you work your butt off. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I, I love it. I love it because it, it's great because, you know, people, I guess, in a lot of workplaces do take, obviously, take their jobs very seriously in the corporate world. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it's like money's on the line. But it's like everyone takes it so seriously and animal animals lives are on the line so so it's just it's a really great group of people I I agree that's one of the best things is everyone you work with it's true yeah I I met so many people who will be my lifetime friends and that's something that I didn't expect because I moved out there for the job for the opportunity to work for this incredible organization that was making huge changes and I really genuinely didn't consider how cool it would be to mm-hmm. be with so many like-minded people who were going to change my life. And I, you know, I feel like I'm sappy saying that, but my gosh, <laughs> I met some amazing folks. You are one of them. Oh, you too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. 
So yeah, and then so share with us kind of a little bit more about the work that you're doing now. I, I see some really incredible things like on social media here and there, but if you want to share with some of us um, everything that you're, you're building right now, I think it's so impressive and I look up to it so much. And um, yeah, just kind of let us know about that. But I'd also love to hear how um, your mindfulness and your ethics um, play a role in your business. Thanks. Um, yeah. So this kind of happened because I just decided <laughs> after leaving PETA, I just couldn't see myself going back into an office environment. And I couldn't see myself, I just couldn't see myself really doing a different job. Uh, I want I wanted to stay in marketing and I wanted to continue doing work that I loved and PETA because it was so fast paced and challenging had really put me through this kind of boot camp of understanding how to manage workflow and understanding how to hold myself to tight deadlines. Mm. And uh, I, I, finally had the confidence to be my own boss. And that was something that I had absolutely never, ever planned for. Um, My family would tell you if you ask them that I've always been really happy working for an organization or a company and having a boss and having um, somebody to kind of give me feedback and give me guidelines and tell me what to do next. I, I really enjoyed being a a worker bee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh I I still feel that way, but I just kind of decided, hey, you know, maybe I can just keep doing this work and uh help help some smaller brands and smaller organizations get their message out there because I've seen what a change it can make when you get your message out there effectively. That was part of my job at PETA. Mm -hmm. So I I kind of started by building my website and thankfully I had the skills to do that on my own. Uh, I saved a lot of money by doing it on my own. Uh, And within a little over a month, I was able, and this is a month of full time working on it. (laughs) I was able to get that built and live and it's very simple, but it's, to the point, and it's kind of just what I wanted to offer. I got mm-hmm. to decide for the first time ever what things I wanted to do every day in my work day. Wow. And that was really eye-opening to say, like, if I don't want to do that, I don't have to. So I mm-hmm. can just tell people what I want to do, and if they need that, then they can be my client. <laughs> yeah. It started from there. So I kind of just I wrote a little bio. I wrote, you know, about the services that I could offer. And those things are, uh, I, I will offer copywriting services. Uh, I offer SEO, search engine optimization for websites. Mm-hmm. Um, and I offer some content creation for social media, as well as social media SEO, mm. which is um, super fun. And they're all things that I I really love. Mm -hmm. And people kind of just started coming to me. (laughs) And that was was lucky. I definitely was lucky to have people pass my name along. I know Mm -hmm. that out there I had connections and friends who saw that I had started a business heard about, you know, another connection who needed a service that I was offering and passed my name along and word of mouth can make a huge impact. And it did. It immediately got me some clients and those clients passed my name along. And that's kind of this crazy (laughs) thing that happens when you love what you're doing and you're delivering quality work and making your clients happy. Yeah. (laughs) That's They'll awesome. tell other people about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so have you ever had a situation where you had someone, a potential client come to you um, that you've turned away? 
Oh, not yet, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really, really hoping that doesn't happen. Uh, but it could, of course it could. Um, with that said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a hard time doing it mm -hmm. because a, there are so many marketing resources available, uh, so many marketing companies who, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but they do not fully care what kind of organizations or businesses mm -hmm. they're taking on as clients. Mm -hmm. uh, for them, it really is just, you know, a client who's a contract and I, I need it to be more. Yeah. And I think about that every day. I think about like, who my ideal client is. And so within the next year, I will be uh, breaking off from this, not getting rid of my current business, but starting kind of an annexed business. Mm. Um, and that will be serving organizations, specifically uh, activists and causes that really need to have a voice and offering marketing solutions for them that are going to be affordable, are going to be understandable mm -hmm. and will not be automated in any way because automated marketing right now is kind of all over the place and it takes away the human voice that needs to be underneath these important causes. Mm -hmm. So that's really going to be my goal. That's going to be what I do moving forward, ideally for my whole life, is serving organizations that really need it. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It it kind of makes me think, and my knowledge of marketing is pretty limited, um, but it kind of makes me think of like lawyers who do like pro bono work about a passion, like a cause they're passionate about. Kind of yes. reminds me of that, but you know, you're starting a whole separate thing about it. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Because as right now I have, a, I have a lot of clients that I love. I love every single one of my clients who are very, very different from each other, mm -hmm. but I have one client in particular, um, who, as soon as I read the material for the organization and the website that they've built, it just made me want to work extra hard for them. <laughs> And that's wow. how I want to feel about every single cause that I work for. Um, which is not to say that I don't feel equally passionate about every client I sign. I want to deliver everybody great work. Right. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course. But this one in particular made me feel like, okay, there are organizations out there who don't have a huge staff of dedicated people in their marketing department or they don't have a marketing department. So yeah. if I can be that for them, wow. then by all means, let me, let me try. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. That's really it great. Makes me happy. It makes me so happy to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I feel like I, I see that all the time. Like, you know, especially with a lot of like, like nonprofit organizations and stuff, like, you know, I imagine what these organizations would be like if they had, like the budget of like Pepsi, you know, or like <laughs> Nike, like, can you imagine what, yeah. like how the world would look like and what, how different things could be if, if nonprofits that, you know, were working on a cause, um, if their message was as prevalent as a lot of these companies selling us things that are actually hurting people, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and people would know, I think that people, especially underserved mm -hmm. populations, people who don't feel like they have an advocate online, mm -hmm. instead of feeling like they were just constantly being pushed a product, they would feel like somebody was trying to reach them with a message. And I feel, you know, that's what happened to me with PETA. They were mm -hmm. trying to reach me and other college students and other people who knew in their hearts that they wanted to change. So if these organizations need help reaching people, mm -hmm. that's what this marketing is for. 
yeah that's that can serve so yeah there there could be big changes that happen if the right organizations reach the right listeners right right absolutely how cool so kind of wrapping up here but for for our listeners here yes. um i guess sort of two two fronts of this question do you have advice um for anyone looking to start their own business um you know become their own boss um so they can choose what products they take on ethically and and you know to to fit all their ethics right not not necessarily just animal rights you know maybe it's a priority um to have a greater work life balance with their family um obviously that's really important to a lot of folks so something like that so advice um you know from someone who has done it and who is doing it of building their own um company and their their own brand and all of that uh advice there and then also if that's not the direction that some of our listeners are going in, you know, maybe they do want to stay aligned with a larger organization or company, but maybe any tips on how they could work within their current structure to still align their ethics with what they're doing without leaving their current job. Yeah. Okay. So for the first group of people yeah. who want to start their own business and they want to break off from what they're doing and, and focus on whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, the first thing I would say is start saving your money right now Mm. and not just saving your money, but make a separate little account or something so that you know, that money is going into your business Mm -hmm. because it's not about business expenses. My business had very little overhead. Um, the only things I paid for initially were, you know, building my website, um, things like that, that really don't cost that much, Mm -hmm. but there's never going to be an easy step where you can continue your full-time job, simultaneously build your business Mm -hmm. and then jump ship from one to the other. It doesn't work that way. You're (laughs) going to have to, at some point, leave your job and have you know, something saved so that you can support yourself so that you can pay for your food Mm -hmm. (laughs) while you're working on building up your business. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say save money. I, I would have saved more (laughs) had I the opportunity to save more. Mm -hmm. Um, So start saving money now, if that's something you're thinking about Mm -hmm. and also start writing stuff down. Even if you're not a writer, just start jotting down your ideas or typing them. Or if you're, um, you know, somebody who likes to talk, start recording them, you know, make notes in your phone with the little voice recorder thing. Uh Um, Just get all your ideas to a place where when you're really ready to start your business, you can just go for it. And you've got everything you need kind of ready for you. Mm -hmm. Because once you start getting clients, you're going to be busy. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, true. And then you're like, I could imagine like it would be that sort of, it's like a snowball effect. And then you're like, wait, what am I doing? Like, this isn't the vision that I had originally. Like if you don't have a clear plan to begin with, then you could just get busy with the work and then go in a direction you didn't want to. Exactly. And you don't want to ruin it for yourself. You want, you know, if you're going to go and start your own business, you want it to be your business. You want it to be what you've been imagining and you want it to serve who you want to serve. So, uh, yeah, just take your time. Don't rush into it and save your money. (laughs) That's my advice for that crowd. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. For those on the other side who want to stay with their full-time gig, definitely. And they want to make sure, you know, it aligns with their ethics. Mm -hmm. Um, Speak up, have an earnest conversation with your colleagues, with your superior. Um, Coming from a place of you want to deliver the best work for them. Mm -hmm. And if anything is holding you back ethically, you're not going to be able to do that. And they want the best work from you. 
So if it is about, you know, I can't work with this particular client because I disagree with them ethically, they really should not have a problem putting you with a different client. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, ethics are as deeply held as in any ideology, whether it's a religion or some other way of life that dictates how you work, how you live, everything you do. If you're able to just communicate that from a place of your own truth, yeah. then people will listen and you will be able to, you know, change what you're doing or alter it enough so that you're comfortable with it. And if you're in a job that you really feel more and more every day disagrees with how you feel ethically, mm -hmm. Even if it's what you want to be doing, like if it's marketing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, or whatever it is, if it's retail and your store starts selling fur, um, oh. if it's marketing and you start serving a client who is a who knows a butcher, um, if it doesn't work for you, understand that your skills can be applied in a different place. They can. Yeah. I know how scary it is to leave a job that's great. I know how scary it is to leave the best paying job of your life or the job where you feel the most connected with people because I've left those jobs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's hard, but know that your skills are always applicable elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, you're just going to find something better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. I think, I think a lot of people, um, don't really know how to like market themselves, you know, um, because it can feel kind like you have to talk yourself up, you know, <laughs> you have to like, I've talked to people who are like, well, it's hard for me to, to fill out a job application because I'm, I'm like humble. I don't like to talk about myself. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, but you need to, <laughs> you need yeah, to talk about why you're I awful. get that. I, <laughs> yeah, it, I know. And people, will always shrug that off and say, oh man, I don't want to do that. I think an easy way to start learning how to talk about yourself is to change those statements of I'm good at this to I feel passionate about this. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. That way you're talking about, you know, what brings you joy and what makes you tick. And honestly, any employer who's worth anything is going to want passionate, dedicated employees. So speaking from a place of I'm committed to this cause, or I feel passionate when I do this, or nothing energizes me more than this, that's, that's going to get you noticed much more than I have this skill, this skill, and this skill. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Because a skill is just kind of like a like a one dimensional thing. Like it's just like lying there. Like you could use it or not, but that there's no like inherent motivation it's behind a skill. Yeah. 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 Wow. Cool. Exciting yeah. stuff. <laughs> great. I think that's all really great advice. So thank you so much, Emmy. Um yeah. is there anything else that you'd like to share that we didn't get to? Um I would like to say hi to the listeners because I don't think they said that to begin with. And if they're still listening at this point, thank you. <laughs> um, and I guess I would just like to close by being corny and saying that uh, you should uh, stick to what you care about and uh, follow your dreams and yeah, do good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, you're, you're a perfect role model for that. So, um, so thank you for coming on the show and thanks for doing everything that you do. Cause like I said, I do look up to you. So, um, really, yeah, really an honor to have you on and, and sharing all of your, your wealth of experience and knowledge. So thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here and thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Emmy. Take care. Thanks. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that interview. I thought it was really interesting, especially for anyone who's ever thought about um, starting their own business or working for themselves, um, or if you've ever dealt with any 
ethical conflicts in the workplace. Um, if so, please reach out. We'll be really interested um, to hear. And I can even pass along any messages you have for Emmy. Um, so she could even respond directly if you'd like. So definitely let us know if you have any questions there. Um, and just in terms of our last segment, listener mail, I still need to respond to Sailor Kate's message about zoos. And um, one of the next episodes will definitely be all about zoos and aquariums because it's a great question, super relevant, I believe, um, year-round, but especially the summertime when a lot of people might be going out to do that as a family activity. So you're learning about um, why those aren't uh, the best places for animals and how it's not great for us to support it, but there's lots of other fun alternatives. And... um, Got uh, a great question that um, I'll respond to next as well about cat food and the ethics of feeding your cat meat when you're a vegan. Good question. Um, And also got um, some requests for a meal plan as um, we're starting up the school year again um, and a lot of people may not work um, in the summertime. We're going to be getting back into the full swing of things, you know, come September for many people. So um, so meal plan as well. So um, keep the questions coming. I usually respond directly, but also sometimes I talk about them on the podcast. So if you have any questions, email me, Facebook message me, Instagram message, and um, I would love to hear anything. You could also post in the group if you'd like to get a a group consensus on something. Love to hear those, and um, and keep those coming. So thank you all very much, and...